do a co-host. Thank you, Jessica. Okay, so um, I'm very excited to have today's class. It's our finale in doing the Book of Ruth. And thanks to all of you, I really learned a lot myself in preparing. Um, today's class is going to be about keeping alive the names and the memory uh, of those who have passed. So today it's a special honor for me uh, that we are going to learn in the merit of Mr. Alan Abraham Shabbat Alav HaShalom, our sponsors, his wife, my friend Joyce Shabbat, and their children, Julius, Joey, Sophia, and Jack, are a beautiful, beautiful family. And my hope is that in the zechut of their character, of their sterling midot, that the legacy of Abraham ben Simcha will be a blessing to all of us. Amen. Um, so we're getting started. We're in the fourth chapter of Megillat Ruth. I cannot believe <laughs> that we've gotten here. And um, the exciting part of this, oh, I forgot to do this. I'm so sorry. One more thing. Okay. Okay, so now that we're in chapter four of Megillat Ruth and we are uh, learning in the merit of Abraham ben Simcha, um, we're finally coming to this resolution in this chapter where Naomi started with this calamity and she's moving from a place of darkness to a place of brilliance, extreme, extreme light. She's moving from the loss uh, of the bitterness, the poverty, and we're going to move to hope and marriage and progeny. It's a, it's a very, very exciting time in the Megillah, but we should also keep in mind as we're learning, this is a parallel for the nation of Israel. Yom Yerushalayim is tonight. Um, we're, we always have Israel in our minds. When we read Megillat Ruth, we have to realize that it's also, it's a parallel for Am Yisrael and for the land of Israel. Meaning that as Naomi and Ruth are being redeemed, the message is clearly here for us, especially during the time of Judges when this book was written, which is a, was a time of darkness, that there is redemption and there is hope. And when we see a family that was practically, uh, um, we, we could have easily given up on them and we see a resurgence, it's, it should bring excitement and hope to us. So I'm gonna start in the beginning of Perek Dalet, chapter four in Megillat Ruth. If you're in the blue books, it's on page 1272. And we're going to read the Pesukim, and then hopefully we'll start and tie, to tie some interesting pieces together. I'm excited to share something at the end that I just discovered today. So if not for Zoom and all of you, I would not be having this on my mind. And I, I found it exciting, so I'll share it as soon as we get to it. But we'll read the verses just so that everybody could have a full sense of what the final Pedic is about. It starts with Uboaz Allah Hashad, and Boaz goes up to the gate. This first sentence, just so you know, is one of the most action-packed for today. So don't worry, I'm going to spend a little time here, but then we'll pick up the pace after this. But this is what's setting the tone for everything that's going to come. So I'll read the whole verse. It's not me. It's going to sound like a run-on sentence, but it, this is how the author chose to present it to us. So Boaz is going up to the gate. Maybe I should give you a tiny background. When we left off, one of the participants texted me that I left them in a cliffhanger. I thought that was pretty funny. We left off last week because we didn't know what was going to happen. Boaz had assured Ruth that he would do right by her, but we didn't really have any guarantees. There was somebody that is first in line, that has first dibs, so to speak, on Ruth. And now we're supposed to be biting our nails and wondering what's gonna happen. Is Ruth 
going to find her happy ending? Is there going to be a romance? They, the writer does a beautiful, beautiful job of keeping us on our toes. And when we get now to verse one, Boaz is going to the gates and he's sitting there and behold, the Goel is passing by that very Goel that Boaz had spoken of. And he tells that Goel, Suda, turn now, Shivapo, sit here, Kloni Almoni, Mr. So and so, it doesn't give him a name, Vayasad Vayeshev. And the, this person that's supposed to be the redeemer that's first in line to redeem Ruth, he comes and he sits. So the first thing we want to do is be appreciative that Boaz does not drag his feet. He's going to take care of the matter. It's urgent for him, as Naomi said it would be. And Allah, every time in text we see that somebody's going up, it's not just a geographic ascent. It's as well a spiritual moral ascent. And he's going up to the Sha'ad. And we know from previous texts that the Sha'ad is always a place of uh, where, where City Hall is. It's, it's a public arena, it's the gate of the city. But in most cities, the gate of the city is where the courts took place, where the important meetings took place. And also conjures, for me, I see the word Sha'ad and I think of the Sha'ad HaShamayim where Yaakov has his dream, and he says, Ein ze ki im bet Elohim veze sha'ar hashamayim. There's something that is going to be very divinely ordained taking place in this gateway, in the gateways. And we, we start to get that idea, and it's confirmed for us because it says that he's sitting there, and usually the people who sit at the gates are the judges. Um, and when there was going to be a court to be convened, it usually was right there. And the next word tells us, vehine. So in case we thought that we were adding violins to a story that was just uh, uh, ordinary, it's not, says the author. Vehine means that God is totally manipulating these events. The English might say, and behold, but behold in text always means, in English it says, just then. We know that there's no such thing as just then. It's the same idea as in chapter two, for instance, in verse four, when it said also, vehine, that all of a sudden she came into the field, vayiker mikreha. All of these words and texts are telling us there's a master plan. There is a, a, somebody who is controlling these events. They're being presented as coincidences, but they're anything but coincidental. This is the hand of God acting specifically. It goes as far, there are commentaries that go as far as to say that even if the Goel wasn't passing by at this particular convenient second, and he was on the other ends of the world, that God would have flown him to this exact place so that this judgment could occur. And um, with Vehineha Goel, and now the Redeemer is Over. When we see the word Over, we might think to ourselves already, there's a little hint, Over means to like pass by or pass over. I, I, I'd like to say he's going to be passing something up, but they don't tell that to us at this point. And so he's passing by. And um, Boaz tells him Suda, and we should notice from the language that Boaz is speaking in a little bit of a uh, command, Suda, like a tzivui, like he's in charge and this person uh, is maybe in some way um, lower on the social uh, ranking than he is. And he says, Suda, Shivapo, sit here, again in command form, and then they give him this name, Ploni Almoni. And it's the equivalent of saying uh, John Doe in today's day and age. And the commentaries do a beautiful thing. They take the name apart and they say Ploni from the word Pele, 
It's something beyond our understanding. And maybe almoni, from the word ilem, a mute, a person who doesn't speak because he's going to be rendered practically mute. We should say that the reason that they don't give his name, now it depends if you're an optimist or a pessimist, you'll choose which way. If you want to say it's to his credit that they don't give his name, they'll say, poor guy, he happened to be in line to be a goel, a redeemer, but it would have been at tremendous expense to his existing family. So in that case, we don't want to embarrass him and put his name down. So for all of eternity, he's known as the guy who didn't live up to his potential. So we're going to sort of protect his identity. So in this witness protection program version, we would say, okay, we understand he can't do it, so we're not going to name him. But a lot of the commentaries are very hard on him. And they say because he didn't redeem the name of either Machlon or Elimelech, the ones who had passed, what happens to him is that his name, he becomes nameless himself. And that's why we don't hear his name. But the next thing that he does is Vayasar Vayeshev. He does this thing. And again, this is the text starting to tell us there's something going on here. This movement, this act um, that is being presented here, if we look up that word vayasad, I, I'd like to take you to three places where it's so prominent, uh, prominently displayed for us to understand what's going on here. The first place uh, that I'd like to take you to is in the uh, Noah story, in chapter 8, verse 13, you don't have to run there because we're going to come right back, but for those of you who want to uh, keep the score, in chapter 8, verse 13, it says, Vayhi ba'achat ba'shesh me'od shana, in the 601st year, ba'rishon ba'chodesh be'echad la'chodesh, on the first day of the first month, the waters dried up, we're talking about Noah, he had spent time in the Teva also. And then we find the word that we have here in our Megillah. Vayasar Noach et mirseh teva And Noach at this point is going to take off the covering of the Teva and he's going to see that the waters have dried up. In other words, chapter 4 is starting to tell us the flood is over. The devastation is over. The worst is over. By the time he could take the covering off his tent, it means that we're coming to, we're coming in for a landing. We're coming into a place where we're going to be safe now. And that's what's going to happen for Naomi, for Ruth. They're going to come to a place of safety. And it's a little more uh, um, obvious on this next Vayasad, because I'll read it. And for those of you who want to play like a little guessing game with yourself, you'll see if you could pinpoint where I'm referring to, Vayasar Paro et Tabato me'al yado. Paro takes his ring off of his hand and he gives it to Yosef. And he dresses Yosef in beautiful clothing, linen clothing, and he gives him a beautiful necklace. And so I'm um, in chapter 41, verse 42 in Bereshit, at this point, Yosef is being, he's being taken from being a slave uh, and a prisoner to becoming the second to the king. So when we see Vayasad in our Megillah, we should start to say, we could, we could breathe a sigh of relief. We could say the ark is now becoming uncovered. It's sunny, smooth sailing ahead. And we say now, He's going to put a ring on it. He's always putting a ring on Yosef. And we know what's about to come with Ruth as well. And he's going to dress her in beautiful in linens like that Eshet Chayel that we read about. And he's going to bedeck her with beautiful jewelry. And then the third place I'd like to show you that this word appears because it sets the entire tone for our uh, chapter is in the book of Shemot, chapter 3, verse 3. Vayomer Moshe. Moshe says, Asudana. Let me turn now and let me see this magnificent 
um, vision, uh, why isn't the snare, the bush burning up in fire? By Yasad Lirot. So Moshe is now going to do this same thing, which is when he comes to the burning bush, it's time for him to fulfill his mission. And he fulfills his mission at 80 years old. And as we look at this, we're seeing that Boaz, many people believe, was elderly too at this point. And this is now an opportunity for um, Boaz to say, it's time for somebody to step up to the plate and it's time for a mission to be fulfilled. And in verse two, he takes 10 men. What's interesting about him taking 10 men, I'm speaking of Boaz, he takes them from the elders of the city. He tells them sit here and they sit as well. So it seems that he's possibly the Avbet Din, he's possibly the head of the court. But what's unusual is courts were usually either three people or 23 people or Sanhedrin, 71 people. It's usually an odd number because if it's gonna be a issue of um, judgment, we need an odd number. So there's a tiebreaker. But here by bringing a quorum of 10 men, we start to get the sense of what Boaz intentions are. We know for a wedding, if there's a, um, like for the Sheva Berachot, you need 10 men for that. So he wants to make sure that he has on hand all the required participants in case there should hopefully be a wedding. And in verse three, he tells the Goel, he gives him the whole story. He said, look, there's a land, there's a field that our brother Elimelech had and uh, Naomi had sold it. You know, Naomi, the one who came back from Sede Moab. And there are a lot of different versions of how we want to understand this, whether this person is the brother of Boaz, who is also the brother of Elimelech, it doesn't seem to make sense because Boaz, we believe, is the nephew of Elimelech, but many people refer to their uncle in text as their brother. We had seen it with Lot and Abraham. We've seen it before. And basically what he's offering him is in verse four, he's saying, Ve'ani amarti egle oznecha lemor. Notice what he's saying. Boaz is telling the Redeemer, I said to myself, mm -hmm, I, I said, I am, and, and in the very casual ani, as opposed to the anochi that we're going to see later, he says, egle oznecha, he's very, very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, he has a, a beautiful strategy, and he's, he says it in a beautiful way. He says, egle, egle means to reveal, galui, you know, to reveal, I'm going to reveal to your ears in other words, I'm not going to make you feel bad that you didn't already step up to the plate. Naomi's already been here, and Ruth has already been here, and you should have done this sooner, but you didn't. I was waiting for you, but nothing. So may maybe you didn't know about it. And so I'm going to make you aware of the situation. The situation is, if you buy in front of all of these people, in front of these elders, if you want to be a redeemer, you can redeem. Now, it was a financial coup at this point for the person who might want to redeem the land because he's going to get it at a very cheap price. So that might be something very exciting to him, especially since he could now add that to his portfolio and buy land on the cheap. Everybody wants in on that deal. And he, he offers, he says, if you want to be the redeemer, be my guest. He's speaking directly to the Redeemer. And then the next few words, it seems like he's addressing an audience. Ve'im lo yig'al, it's like a third person. If he, the Redeemer, doesn't redeem, then let me know, because there's nobody else in line before me, says Boaz, other than you. And then he uses the word anochi, ve'anochi acharecha. I will go from being a casual ani to an anochi, a much more formal version of myself. Anochi in text always means a person who's fulfilling their mission, who's stepping up to the plate, who's recognizing their potential. Anochi is a big word. And he says, Ve'anochi I'm after you. And the other guy says, no thanks, you, you, thanks for the offer, but anochi egal. The redeemer says, I'm on board, I'll take it. 
But in verse five comes the caveat. Boaz tells him, oh, by the way, on the day that you buy this field dirt cheap, literally, from the hands of Naomi, he feels he's going to buy it from the hands of Naomi, and now him and his children have all this extra ancestral land that they own. Don't forget, you're buying it also from Ruth HaMoaviah. And she is the wife of the person who has passed on. And you're going to actually be buying it Lehakim Shem Hamet Al Nachalato. This is not just a easy uh, um, purchase when you buy the land. There's a package deal going on here. The package deal is that you're going to have to take Ruth together with the land, and we want to reestablish the name of the man who passed. At this, we know it's Machlon. We want to restore his name on his land. So what does that mean? You want the land at a bargain. It means that you have to take a Ruth, have a child with her, name the child after her husband, and let that child with her husband's name own that land. And that's how you'll be restoring the dead person on his property. And the Goel hears that, and he says in verse 6, thank you very much, but I cannot afford to take this offer because pen ashchit et nachalati, I might be destroying, it will be too big of an investment for me to make. We're imagining that he already has a wife and already has children, so to take on another wife and the children from that wife are going to inherit the new land, it's not going to do anything for his current family, he says, pen ashchit, and we hear in those words a little bit of the onan, the um, son of the husband, the first, second husband of Tamar, v'shichet, that he spilt his seed. It means pen ashchit, I'm not going to give seed to this woman because it will compromise my current. And this is where a lot of the commentaries have mercy on him and say, don't be so hard on him. He does have an obligation and a responsibility to his current family. If he can't do it, he can't do it. I mean, there's two ways to look at it. But he says, um, I cannot be the one who is going to be redeemed. And all of this, and many people think that Ruth, the book of Ruth, is here to uh, attest or affirm a lot of the laws that were given in the Torah, one of the famous ones in Devarim, chapter 25, verse 5, if two brothers sit together or live together and one of them dies, uben Einlon, he doesn't have any sons, then the wife of the deceased shouldn't be uh, left hachutza, left le'ish zar to a stranger. Yevama, you need to perform this yibum ceremony and take him, take her as a wife. So what is this Yibum ceremony? This is what we're going to see now in the next verse. Verse seven says, Vezot lifnim Israel. This is what used to take place in Yisrael. Al ha-geula ve'al ha-temura, about redemptions, lekayem kol davar, in order for everything to be properly established, a man, shalaf ish na'alo, a man would take off his shoe, give it to his friend, and that was today's version of, I would say, a handshake, let's say. It would be done with somebody passing on of the shoe. And Devarim goes into it a little bit more in detail, where if the man doesn't want to, if the man doesn't want to take Yivim To, the woman that he is supposed to be redeeming, then what happens? They take her up to the judges and he makes a declaration and he says, I don't want to take her. And in front of all the elders, um, he takes off his shoe. And in Devarim, in the book of Devarim, chapter 25, the way it's described is a little bit uh, graphic. Ve'yarka befanav. She, excuse my language, it's not me, it's the Torah. She spits in his face. And um, she says, laish. this is what's going to happen to a person who doesn't build up his brother's house. 
I'm not bringing you here to be uh, um, speaking so negatively about the ploni almoni who doesn't do it, rather than I want to show you how much appreciative the text is about the brother that does do it. But you should know one thing. This is in the Torah. His name is changed. The person who doesn't step up to the plate, his name is changed and becomes Bet Chalutz Hanaal. Mr. Uh, shoe, uh, you know, gone wrong or whatever. The guy who didn't want to uh, do right with his shoe by claiming the woman. So the person gets an actual name change and this is all in the Torah. This is not a rabbinical thing that, you know, is being exaggerated, excuse me. <coughs> One second. And so we ask this question and a lot of people have toyed with what's the business with the shoe? Why with a shoe? Why would somebody have to take off a shoe if he doesn't want to marry his brother's widow or his close family's widow? And um, I'd like to think that we've seen shoes taking place in text before. An interesting place that might correspond to this is when Moshe first comes to Har Sinai, when he comes to the burning bush, same, that same story from the Vayasad is coming back here. God tells him, take your shoes off your feet because you're standing on Admat Kodesh. This land that you're standing on is holy land. It's holy grail. It's, it's, a, it's a place where there's divine presence. And so maybe in a person taking off this shoe is recognizing that God, that there's a divine presence in this um, transaction, so to speak. And that would be the taking off the shoe to, re to represent standing in a place of holiness. And, and we know even today in courts, people will swear on a Bible or they'll, you know, in God we trust. There's a lot of godliness having to do with a lot of um, issues like this. And so taking off a shoe might be a representation of that. Uh, regardless, the Goel tells Boaz, you buy it takes off his shoe, and in verse 9, Boaz tells the Zekinim, you are all witnesses today. And we knew that he wanted 10 men because he really wanted the witnesses. And he's saying, today I have purchased everything that belongs to Elimelech and everything that belongs to Kilion and Machlon, those were the two children of Naomi and Elimelech, and I'm purchasing them from Naomi. And in verse 10, he says, and also Ruth, the Moabite, the wife of Machlon, Kaniti Lila Isha. You could imagine that her heart was racing when the other guy said he would marry her, and now she is relieved that he utters these words, I am going to marry, I'm going to acquire for myself Ruth as a wife. Lehakim Shem Hamet Al Nachalato, exactly as prescribed by the law to uphold and resurrect the name of the deceased on his property. Because a person's name should not be cut off from his brothers because he doesn't have a bloodline. Or from the place of his gates. All of you today are witnesses. And you'll notice in the next four verses, I like to notice these things. I think it's very beautiful. The name of God that's been hidden for a lot of the drama all of a sudden comes back in spades. Every one of the next four verses is uttering God's name, God's name, because it's starting to tell us the way that redemption happens is sometimes God redeems us first and then we're able to recognize his greatness and his glory and his presence amongst us. And so in this case and in this story specifically, it's very hard for us to pinpoint a turning point where we want to ask ourselves, well, what did they do right in order to merit all of this blessing and all of this greatness? And some of us might say that Ruth and her behavior and Boaz and his behavior was enough to tip the scales for the entire nation. But I'd like you to notice verse 11, the warmth the, uh, what's, um, I'm looking for a word there, they're so uh, um, embracing 
of this union, Vayomru Kol Ha'am Asher Basha'ar. All of a sudden, the whole nation, bunch of busybodies, everybody happens to be at the Sha'ar and the Zekenim, the ones who are witnesses, the elders, and they all say these words, <clears throat> and we say them under the chuppah till this very day. Yiten Hashem et ha'isha, the Hashem should give this woman that's coming to El Betecha, to your house, Kerachel ukelea, like Rachel and Lea, that they both built a house, the house of Israel, Ve'asechayel, remember, he was an Ishchayel and she was an Eshetchayel, and they should make, they should do great things in Ephrata, and they should make a name in Bet Lechem. It seems in this one verse, everything is coming back. All is right in the world. We're back in Ephrat, those verses that we saw right at the beginning of the Megillah. <clears throat> they will reference Ephrat. They will reference Bet Lechem. But they're even going as far. We're rewinding, and I want us to get ready also. You know that if you learn with me, you have to press that rewind button in Torah to scope and scan where, what do you think they're saying? Why reference Rachel and Leah? Of course, the two of them did build Bet Yisrael, because Yaakov's name is Yisrael. But this Isha should be like Rachel and Leah all rolled in one. You shouldn't have to have the issues of having two wives to, to resurrect Bet Yisrael. It should be in one woman with no strife, and they go to the next verse. Notice how we keep rewinding. Vayhi betcha kebet peretz, and your house that you build together with Ruth should be like the house of peretz that Tamad had given birth to for Yehuda from the seed that Hashem will give you from this Ne'ara. It's beautiful is also, she had been married, she was a widow, but there, you st we start to see something very generous taking place. That once Boaz embraces this woman, Ruth, the people are so uh, magnanimous about it. They don't say, oh, look, did you see? Did you hear who Boaz is marrying? He did. She's marrying him for his money. He's marrying her because she's pretty. No, nobody's buzzing anything. All they're doing is showering blessing, throwing God's name. And if anything, they reframed her to being a ne'ara, a young maiden. Nobody's talking about the fact that she was married. Nobody's talking about the fact that she, her husband died. Nobody's mentioning that she was a Moavia. That's not even in the cards anymore. All of that is being washed away. It's a little bit of a lesson for us as well that if we want to be redeemed with all our imperfections, maybe we should start looking at people and treating them and talking about them and, and not highlight and be picky uni about all of their defects because we're no better ourselves. Every human has their own issues. And so for them to say, she should be like the house of Peretz that Tamad gave, you know who Tamad was, and it's not, it's not enough time today, but Tamad is a heroine. Um, if, if there was another one of the Imahot, Tamad would make that list. She's a matriarch. She is a matriarch. If not for Tamad, the whole house of Yehuda would have become extinct. And she's the one who gives seed to Yehuda. And so this Ruth, without Ruth, well, also the uh, uh, family line of Elimelech, of Machlon, Kilion, Naomi, they would have become extinct. So they found a way to praise her, and they found a very generous way to praise her. And in verse 13, Boaz finally takes Ruth, she becomes his wife, and Hashem gives her pregnancy, and she gives birth to a son. <clears throat> What's beautiful for me when I read these verses is if this is a parallel to the way that God is going to save the Jewish people, then in one verse, boom, 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 he marries her, he cohabitates with her, and she gets pregnant and she has a child. One, two, three, meaning the Yeshua is Keheref Ayin in, in one minute, in, in the blink of an eye, literally, 
We can go from mourning to happiness, from darkness to light, from childlessness to a child. And look how nice all the women, all the women come to Naomi. And again, he is God's name, the fourth time in a row. Baruch Hashem, we should know. Our community is very this way. We always have God's names on our lips. I know my own family growing up, my mother, my aunts, my grandparents, everybody in my family and extended family was always using God's name for everything. Allah ma'ek, God should be with you. Allah ya'atiki, Allah this. Allah is the, is the Syrian name for God, but everything we did was a God should bless you, God should be with you. And this is a community now. This is the birth of a nation where God is on their minds and on their lips, in their words. And this is what's going to bring the blessing, is involving God in every single thing. So these women tell Naomi, Baruch Hashem, they right away recognize that this is the work of God. Whereas before we started our Megillah in a time of famine, and famine is a spiritual famine, is what brings a physical famine, where the people were totally worshiping idols. We know the book of Shoftim, and we've gone through what those cycles were, where they would worship idols and they would sin and be punished until they were redeemed over and over again. And here, finally, it looks like they broke the cycle and they're able to recognize God. And they said, Asher lo hishpit lach ko el hayom, that God has not withheld a redeemer from you today. Vaikare shemo bi Israel. You know, we say these words um, at a brit milah before we name a child. We say his name in Israel shall be. And we make a big fuss about it because names are very important. Here, we're talking about bringing back the names of Naomi's ancestors, and we are going to give this child a name, and ironically, we don't name him Mahlon, and the commentaries seem to be a little happy about that, because Mahlon has a negative connotation to it, like Mahala is a sickness or an illness, so they don't name him Mahlon per se, but verse 15, now, the townspeople are chatter boxing their way through the text like never before. They have so much to say. You know, they say she should be like the, the, this. Ruth is like Tamad, and they're saying that uh, good for you, you still have a redeemer. They have so much to say. They're saying, You know what this child is going to do for you? It's not just going to restore your husband's soul, Naomi. It's going to restore your soul, your own soul as well. It's going to literally feed you and nourish you. Look, from a pragmatic standpoint, practically speaking, yes, because now we have fields, you're going to be nourished in a physical way. But the Meshiv Nafesh comes before the nourishment or the resurrection or the restoring of the soul is mentioned before the actual physical sustenance that's going to come from this. And that's because that's what Naomi needed most. And these words are beautiful. Ki kalatech, oh, I love it. Ki kalatech asher ahevatech. You know that kala of yours, that one that completes you? like from the word Vayichulu, she's a completion for you. You love her and she loves you. And because the two of you have this special relationship, he tovalach, you know what she's better for you then? She's better for you than seven sons. And of all the arbitrary numbers to choose, why would they say she's better for you than seven sons? I'd like to suggest She's as good for you as seven generations. And I will explain how the sons are generations, but that's going to be towards the end. So hold that thought. And Naomi takes this child, and this is a beautiful, again, we must have in mind that this is also an allegory for our national story of redemption, for the redemption not just of our nation, which is clear, but for the redemption of humanity as well. And what do I mean by that? You'll see it right here in the words. 
Naomi takes the child and she brings it to her bosom and she's literally a nurse for this child. And somewhere in the recesses of our mind, we can't help think of that verse, Vesara Henika Banim. The people are gonna say, Sarah is nursing at her age. How is it possible? Now, whether or not she literally had a miracle and some commentaries will say she did, and that was the miracle is that Naomi was able to breastfeed even though she was not the one to give birth to the child. It's all to send a message for us. It's all for us to understand. Yes, maybe she was a nurse, but the word for omenet is ne'emanut, is a trustee, is a person ne'eman, like amen, somebody that we could trust. And she becomes for him this, this uh, stability, this place of stability. And why we need to read it this way is because ultimately it's God who's the one who's going to be nurturing us. When we come back as a nation and when we're reestablished, God is giving us these analogies of he will be like that nursing mother to us. Is there anybody more compassionate to a newborn child than a nursing mother is to her infant? That is possibly the closest, most unconditional love that a parent, a mother could give her born child. And so here God is also telling us, this is our national story. When you come back, you're going to be a beautiful thing as well about a baby, about a newborn innocence. The fact that you're gonna come back, I'm not gonna hold your past against you, says God. I'm going to bring you back. I will be the nursing mother and you will be the child and our relationship will be born as a newborn. It will start new and start fresh. And notice in verse 17, these ladies, I was calling them the chatterboxes and the busybodies, and they're in everybody's business and they have everything to say, but look what happens to them in verse 17. Because they have God on their lips with every statement that they make, vatiknenalo, Hashechenot Shem. Who's naming this child? You'd think either Boaz. Very often in biblical text, the father names the child. Or if not the father, the mother. We know Leah and Rachel names a lot of their children. Or maybe you want to say Naomi. They gave her the, uh, the honor of naming the child because they said it's like a son to her. Instead, you know who names the children? The child, excuse me, the Shechenot. Shechenot will say in English, the neighbors or the neighborhood, the townspeople. But the word for the neighbors, Shechenot, is rooted in the word Shechen. A Shechen, a Shechinah, for instance, is something or somebody that resides in very close proximity to you. And the name that we give to God's presence in our midst is this same word, Shekhinah. So these women are now going to play the role of the Shekhinah itself. Of, so it's as if you really want to take it to the next level. It's as if God is naming this baby as well. So on the physical level, it's the neighbors naming the baby. On a spiritual level, the name that they're going to give him is going to be divinely inspired. And they keep insisting, it says on the birth certificate, that this child's mother is Naomi. Yulad ben la Naomi. And they name him Oved. And this Oved is the father of Yishai, who's the father of David, and then the next few verses go into a genealogy. So I'd like to make a suggestion for today. Uh, before we get to our punchline, I want you to think about the name Oved and possibly what could be the reason that this child would be given that name, especially since we said we made a whole fuss that the child was supposed to redeem the name of his father who had passed. We didn't name him Mahlon, we named him Oved, O-V-E-D, Oved. What, what, what significance 
might that have for us? I hope your wheels are turning. Um, what's beautiful here is that they go into a genealogy and they start with Peretz. And they say, this is the Toldot. This is the, these are the generations from Peretz. And from Peretz, they're going to say, Peretz gives birth to Chetzron, gives birth to Ram, gives birth to Aminadav, gives birth to Nachshon, that's our famous Nachshon ben Aminadav, gives birth to Salmon, who gives birth to Boaz. I'm stopping there for a minute, because in case you weren't doing this, Peretz, Chetzron, Ram, Aminadav, Nachshon, Salmon, Boaz. Seven generations. Remember we had said that the child is as great for you as seven sons, and I suggested that maybe it means seven generations? Well, Boaz is possibly the seventh, or is the seventh generation from Peretz. Who was Peretz? Peretz is the child of Tamad that the neighbors were talking about. But Peretz gets his name from Paratzta, like who Paratzta? The word Peretz means to burst forth, to break conventions, to just do the right thing and to step up to the plate. And so Boaz, the seventh generation from Perez, is reestablishing this entire, if you can establish in seven generations, if the seventh generation could keep the ideals of the first generation, now you have something that's called established. And so Boaz is reestablishing Perez's legacy. But if we go further from Peretz, then we go to Oved, Yishai, David, and after David, we have Shelomo. So King Solomon, if he's the seventh generation, then he would be the seventh generation to who? I'll give it to you. Nachshon, Salmon, Boaz, Oved, Yishai, David, Shlomo. King Solomon is actually going to establish the legacy that Nachshon ben Aminadab started. Most people know Nachshon. He's famous for being, according to the commentaries, the first one to jump into um, the waters when they were leaving Egypt. And according to that commentary, when he jumped into the waters, the sea split. And so Shalomo and this entire dynasty is telling us we're dealing with the blue blood that is Yaakov, that is Yaakov and that is really Yehuda. And the reason why we have to make such a story and make this about Yehuda and make this about Peretz and Tamad is because the national redemption very much mirrors what happened with Yehuda and Tamad, where we could make a mistake. Yehuda makes a grave mistake. He considers his daughter-in-law a black widow. He doesn't give his third child. It's as if they would have had a ceremony. She would have spit in his face, literally. And Yehuda comes back from that. And I think that's the most important part to this story. The fact that it doesn't matter how far we veer off the track, there's always a road back. And if Yehuda could come back from selling his brother, from marrying his two sons to a Canaanite woman, from having that woman sit as a widow unfairly in her father's house with having no intentions of ever redeeming her until he's trapped and she's about to be burnt at the stake, if he could come back, and he doesn't just come back from that, he comes back from that in a big way and he and his descendants end up being the majesty of our nation. Well, the book of Ruth is here to tell us there's nothing that you're going to do that's so terrible that's going to block the road, that's going to block the way back for your redemption. Look, I know there are a lot of laws in the Torah that say you get karet, and I'm not negating that. But I'm going to give you a couple now of situations. I would say Yehuda is pretty bad because he is the brother 
who sells his own brother. It's his idea to sell his own brother. And he does a lot of intra-brother uh, transgressions, so to speak. But the truth is, if we're going to talk about brothers, I first want to just take, because I see I have a couple of minutes, I want to take one more minute and say that the way that we could uh, really see this seven generations uh, system and how it works, it works beautifully with the daughters of Selofchad as well. I'll just read it for you quickly. Uh, the daughters of Selofchad, it's going to be now in the book of Bimidvad. The daughters of Selofchad, it's the daughters. Their father is Selofchad. He's the son of Hefer, who's the son of Gilad, who's the son of Mechid, who's the son of Menashe, who's actually the son of Yosef. So Yosef and the daughters of Selofchad, and I like to bring this example because it's beautiful. This doesn't just happen on a male line. This is not just something where the men make the story. Because in our story, we'd like to say from Yehuda to Boaz or from Pede, to, but guess what? The Megillah keeps saying, don't forget, if not for Tamar, we wouldn't have the story end this way or turn this way. And the same thing happens with the daughters of Selofchad. So the women play a huge role here. And if we want to connect Yosef to the daughters of Selofchad, what do the daughters of Selofchad want? The same thing that we wanted in this Megillah. We want to uphold the name of those who have passed and have it secured on property, on land in Eretz Israel. That's what these women want. And how is it that they redeem Yosef, their seventh generation? What did Yosef want more than anything in the world? His dying wish on his deathbed, literally. Is he said, please, God is going to take you out of this, this place. Make sure you take my bones with you. Make sure you carry me into the land. Make sure I have a part in the land. And by you carrying me into the land, you're reestablishing our connection as brothers and the fact that we have peace and love between us. So we hear this over and over. And I'd like to take you to the earliest story. I can't help it because I had told you that we needed to figure out why did we name this kid Oved? Why Oved of all names? especially when we had a name already, we had, uh, you know, blankets embroidered that said Machlon on them. We know this kid's going to be named Machlon and now he changed his name to Oved. I think the Torah is saying something absolutely magnificent. And it's right here. I had never noticed it, but it's right here. When Boaz says that what they're doing is they are acquiring, they are purchasing, he uses the word Beyom Kanotcha, Eshet Hamet, when you marry, when you acquire this woman, it says Kaniti, but it's read Kanita. It's called Kri Uchtiv. It's spelt one way. If you're looking for it, it's in verse five. It's, it's spelt Kaniti. Do you know what Kaniti is? You know who said Kaniti the first time ever? Chava the first woman, when she gives birth to her child, Cain, she says, Kaniti ish et ha Elohim. I have acquired a man together with God. And do you know what the, um, uh, what he did for a living? I'm trying, the occupation. Do you know what the occupation of that man was? that Ish, that Shikaniti was Kayin. And his occupation was an Oved, an Oved Adama. His brother was a Roetzon, but he was an Oved Adama. And I'd like to suggest for today, this is the finale of our Book of Ruth, and I'd like to suggest that what Megillat Ruth is telling us is that we have the ability to literally change history, to change the way history, to change the way history is recorded. What I mean by that is that by naming this child Oved, we're naming him as much as after Machlon and Elimelech and that whole family line, 
we're also naming him after Cain. And why is that? Because we're giving Cain a new name. He's no longer going to be known as the brother who was a murderer, but we're going to give him a name like Oved. I should go one further and say the first person who was actually an Oved was Adam. Adam was given charge of the world, le avda le shamra. But it wasn't just of the physical world that we know it now. It was in the garden. In the Garden of Eden, his job was to be an Oved. This child being named Oved would be able to conjure for us this possibility of us returning to an Eden-like existence for us to be able to not just undo, I know we can't undo what Cain did, but the way that Ruth could be called a ne'ara, we could sort of turn back the clock, so to speak. We could actually be redeeming Hevel as well, because he never had a lineage from him. If we actually see, it's so beautiful, since we were counting the seven generations, and I have my last minute, so I'd like to use it with this, if we count the generations from Cain and Hevel, seven generations, Cain, Hanoch, Irad, Mechiael, Metushael, Lemech, and we get to Yaval and Yuval. Yaval and Yuval, that's representative of the Yovel, the Jubilee, the time that everything is able to revert back to its pristine original intended state. Uh, slaves are free, land goes back to its original owner, and it says specifically, Bishnat Hayovel in Vayikra 25, Bishnat Hayovel Hazot, Tashuvu Ish El Achuzato. And so we have this beautiful circle being closed. If we restore our brother's name, and we restore brotherhood, so to speak. We're not just bringing our brother's name to his land, but God's telling us, I entitled the class Home Sweet Home because there's always a way back home. Naomi, with all her embarrassment, she found a way to get back home. And as a nation of Israel, no matter what we do, and we've seen it in the book of Shoftim, there's always a way back home. Even Hevel, who never had a redeemer, or Adam, who was chased out of Eden, there's a way back home for them also. We're going to resurrect their names in the, in the sense of the name Oved. And to me, what's most beautiful is when we do come back home, and sometimes we're afraid to see what's waiting for us. Sometimes we really burn so many bridges and we do so many crazy things that we feel that we trap ourselves from going back home. We don't know what we're going to find. We don't know what we're going to see, what's awaiting us there. But the Torah is generous, and they give us an image, and they show us, and they say, all you have to do is come back home. Hashem is waiting there. His arms are open wide. He's ready to treat us like a mother who is nursing her newborn child. And with this, we, I'd like to end the series and I'd like to hope and pray in the merit of Abraham ben Simcha that we all merit to once again be restored as a nation on our land, have all the names of the deceased pray for us, bring merit to us, reunite us with those that we, we love and um, bring a redemption that's one of happiness in a peaceful, beautiful way. This redemption happens without any wars. I'm just gonna say this because I feel strongly about it. Some of us have the notion that the only way for the final redemption to come is through these wars and Armageddons and Gog and Magog. But I think the Megillah is proving to us that the human capacity for kindness and for generosity is so great that we can find this place of redemption in God's arms through peaceful chesed and um, in beautiful ways.